So one of my favorite things about Jesse's podcasts, especially the perfect cast, is that he'll actually record it in segments over the course of like a week or however long it takes to set up the podcast. It's something that had never really occurred to me. Um, you know, it's sort of a thing that you're a luxury you're afforded by doing a solo podcast as opposed to having other guests because you don't have to organize a bunch of people to get together more than once, you know, in the course of, a, of however long. You can just record segments and throw them in and it's it's no biggie so i wanted to do that this is being recorded on the 24th um right after uh having woken up after releasing the previous podcast i actually passed out listening to my own podcast i did not make it all the way through um i just sort of had it on and then crashed uh that fucking theme of, of, uh, of guts from berserk man it's a it's a real soothing track so anyways, um, I wanted to continue a thought that I like kind of cut myself off with in there, where I was rambling so much about how scatterbrained I am that I scatterbrainedly forgot what I was going to say. Because I was saying that, um, towards the beginning I said that when I go out to eat or something or like celebrate after releasing a video that it creates a sort of bad habit and I said I'd get back to it and I never did well here's the explanation of that that I have realized over the last week which is that um, by not having the catharsis of having accomplished something I think it helps to drive me to keep creating stuff like out of desperation because like for me you know, that moment when the video goes live and I see the first couple comments and I sort of confirm that it's there is like the big release. You know, it's like it's the it's the coming night and day, if you will, of like finishing, you know, I've written something that I'm proud of and I feel great about it. But it, it's not until it's out there that it feels over, you know, that like the thing is done and now I can just bask in the glory of having done it, you know. So when I put out a video, when one actually releases, that's when I feel like the, ah, now I have done something. And then I tend to, you know, calm down and relax and do other stuff and not feel the need to, you know, stress over the next video as much. But I think that because of the way that, like, I gave Davu these two videos to edit and I've been working on all this other stuff, then, like, there's been no... Like with the novel worth of videos that I've been working on, there's been no sense of release yet because all six videos are not out. You know, Davu hasn't even he hasn't even considered starting working on them because he's working on the previous videos, and we still have one more that we want to do before uh, September's over that we haven't even started on yet. Or not September, October. But anyways, uh, yeah. So all these things that are piling up, it helps to fuel itself where it's like I can keep working and working because I haven't felt that any of these projects have concluded so it's it's easier to you know keep going through that stuff. Um, which is kind of uh, why I like part of the reason I've slowed down vlogs a bit because when I was doing tons and tons of vlogs it was like this constant sensation of getting things done which was uh, in at some point when it was like at its at its most height like when I was just doing shit tons of vlogs like after the summer season of anime and I was like covering all the or was it the spring season the spring season when the spring season ended and like I covered all those shows then um there was a brief period where I wasn't working on the main channel quite as much and part of that was because I was you know building up to this whole everyone moving in thing and I really thought I was gonna like make vlogs the central focus on my channel which st I still have plans to make vlogs a bigger focus me and Victor just finally got the lighting setup done for the studio space that we have that you that the plebe and the weeb was filmed in um I mean we were using Victor's like professional lighting kit for that and we probably will again for the plebe and the weeb because that one's a little bit higher of a production value but like with the original concept of building the studio was that I wanted there to be lights that are just in there and that the, once the studio was set up it would be very easy to just walk in turn everything on and start filming you know I wanted it to be a setup that uh, that that if I wanted to do just casual vlogs with like me and whoever else was with me then we could easily set it up and easily shoot it and it would look professional enough that it could go on the main channel but it wouldn't be like a super high production value video you know so we finally got the lights set up to make that possible and I just need to finish building the set and then you know I haven't been vlogging currently because I'm working on all these huge projects but like 
the fact that I already have six videos written, like, if we decided not to go through with a video every day for all of November, I still have more than enough videos to cover November. So, like, you know, at some point, when I've written so far ahead of myself that I've got, like, months worth of backlog ready to go, then, uh, vlogging will be easy, because I'll just be like, uh, wow, all my work for this month is completely done, so I can just do whatever I want. Let's vlog, you know? Um, or just keep my backlog going, just keep building it bigger and bigger until I've got like a, you know, I've gotten way ahead of myself, which would be great. Getting ahead of yourself is something that I think every creative wants and none of us have pulled off. You know, everyone I know talks about how badly they want to have a backlog. Everyone really wants, or, or at least to have, you know, just to have... God, even just like to be a couple weeks ahead of yourself, to not always feel like you're at the end of your rope at the end of the month. Like, oh my God, I have to have something come out, you know, uh, in the next few days or else I'm not going to make any money this month, you know, like to already have that financial guarantee allows you to go and experiment and do other things in the meantime, which is why I wanted my Patreon to get so high and it has gotten to that point where like I've got enough money now that I can make a few videos and then go experiment and go do whatever I want, you know, um, or in the case of, uh, like the early months of this year, me and Davu were like following a tight schedule where I was like planning out all the videos that were going to happen in a month and then I'd give him the plans and we were like editing down to a, s a specific time frame, um, but yeah, we can keep doing stuff like that now, and so, um, the vlogs will probably start coming, but, uh, but yeah, I do think that there's some value in just stockpiling stuff and never getting that sense of, like, I'm just done. Oh, we put out a video. I feel so good. I don't feel like I have to do anything else for the rest of the week, you know? It's it's a lot more intense. And I like it this way because, like, I'm, it might sound like, well, you know, that lack of gratification must be, you know, must make it difficult. It's like, you know... It's not, it's like not jacking off for, for a whole week, but you know what happens when you don't do that is that you, uh, at the end, when you finally do, then it's bigger and better than ever before. And so, but, but the thing is that, you know, oh God, I can't, I can't stop with this jacking off metaphor, so I apologize ahead of time. But the thing is that the act of jacking off is already the part that feels good, you know? The, the big, after you come, then you just feel like bored and miserable. So really, it's like I'm edging my way through all these videos and it feels great because I'm constantly writing and writing makes me feel great or working on videos makes me feel great. So it's like this nonstop edging and thankfully, unlike with, uh, with masturbation, it doesn't eventually give you blue balls and start to hurt. Although I guess my, my back hurts a lot from sitting in this chair for like two weeks straight, you know, and not moving and not doing anything. So I guess that's the blue balls of the writing world. I apologize for how disgusting this metaphor got. Alright, this is section two. It's around five in the morning on the 26th of October, and I just woke up, but I wanted to talk about some stuff. I'm gonna talk shop for a little bit. I'm gonna talk about some of the secrets of how I do my work and how I, how I approach trying to have a successful YouTube channel. Because, um, I know some people who are really, like, all about chasing the numbers, chasing success, trying to, you know, make something that appeals to the highest number of people, or is, like, trendy, or just, like, you know, what can I cover that everyone wants to see right now? And there's other people who are completely against even attempting to, you know, curb their content towards uh, mass appeal. And personally, I kind of fall not so much in the middle, so much as all-encompassing. What my goal has always been is how can I talk about whatever I want and make people care about it? You know, how can I drive people towards my opinions and my content and the things I want to talk about? Like, how can I make them want to engage with this? So. You know, and I'm, I'm not saying that uh, that every project can do this. Sometimes I do stuff just because I feel like it. Like Akiyuki Shinbo in the 90s, a video series that, as I mentioned in the last uh, episode of this, like, 
I never expected it to be huge. Now, Aki Yushinbo is a pretty uh, well-known anime director, so I, I knew this was not going to be like a go-nowhere series in the way that it would be if, say, I had made a video called uh, Shinichiro Kobayashi in the ever, you know, no one knows who that is, which is why that video is called The Master in the Background of 40 Years of Japanese Anime, or whatever it's called. Um, so, so yeah, like, with Shinbo, I knew I could at least use his name, but, you know, the first video, it's got a big face of Hiei from Yu Yu Hakusho, because it's the most popular show that Shinbo worked on, the one that would probably get the most people to click on it on the basis of what character was on the thumbnail. And I don't think anyone truly appreciates how fucking important the thumbnail and title are for a YouTube video success. No one seems to get it. Like, I keep telling people, and they're like, okay, yeah, sure, that seems right, you know, and I keep showing them the numbers and how they correlate, they're like, okay, I guess, you know, but no one, <laughs> you don't understand. The only thing that matters if you want your video to be successful is the title and the fucking thumbnail. That's it. That is all that matters. Because no one knows what the content of your video is until they click on it. No one has any idea. You know, they don't know how great your video is, they don't know how genius it is, they don't know what's going on with it. In fact, they don't really know that until it gets to a point where it's genius, you know? I think one of the biggest reasons that Endless Jess has never, you know, gotten the, like, acclaim that he deserves is because he takes too much of an artistic approach to his videos, where his titles are always very clever, especially if you know the video, you always are like, wow, that's a, that's a genius title, but it's not clickbait, you know? Or it'll have a great thumbnail that's like really iconically staged, but it's not clickbait. Because what clickbait is, is a close-up of someone's face. It always is that. It's always a close-up of someone's face. And if you, like, take the YouTube tutoring shit, like where, you know, you get contacts from YouTube themselves and, like, have advice with them, they tell you this. They tell you, like, close-ups of faces, that's what works, you know? I started doing it after Game Grumps talked about it. Like, they said that, uh, you know, they had looked at all the big channels, all the market research, and everyone who was successful was saying, yeah, close-ups of faces. Because it's just the most, like, intimate human connection. You can form with something instantly. You see a bright, starry face, you know, you just want to click on it, or a, or a gross face, or someone making a face, you know, some kind of reaction face. They always work. It's why, like, the, the React series, uh, the, you know, whoever reacts to whatever series is, like, always three pictures of people's faces making different extreme reactions, you know, or why every, every big YouTuber, you know, puts themselves edited into the thumbnails. Um, you know, w we were parodying that with Movie News Weekly, uh, my brother's, um, hilarious video that's on Digibro After Dark. And, like, I understand why that could be frustrating for people. Like, someone like Jesse, I don't see him ever trying to curb himself to, like, have every video have a face thumbnail. He would not do that, because it would be artistically dissatisfying, you know, that instead of coming up with these genius thumbnails that he does for every video that aren't clickbait, but they are great thumbnails, uh, you know, to instead try to make stuff that appeals to everybody. Now, for me, what I enjoy the most is when I get to have my cake and eat it too. When I get to do exactly what I want to do, but also convince people that they want the same thing. So that's why I go all out on the clickbait of the thumbnails and the titles. Because to me, those are the least important elements of my video anyway. You know, those, have, those are an afterthought. They have nothing to do with the actual content of the video. The job of the title and the thumbnail is just to get people to click on the video. And especially, if I can, if I can somehow get you, if I, if I can have a, a thumbnail and a, and a, and a, uh, and a title that are just dishonest enough to get you to click on the video, but not so dishonest that you feel lied to after you watch the video, that's the perfect sweet spot. That's what I'm always going for. It's how can I title this in a way that, so like, you know, I just put out this video called 10 Anime Music Videos You Should Check Out. Now, you, you already know that the clickbait formula is top 10s. All the biggest anime channels are top 10 channels, ten, best anime tops, or like, uh, you know, Misty Cronexia. They do top 10s. Um, 
it's just a clean number that people always want to know. Now, I didn't do top 10 anime music videos, and that would have gotten even better results probably, but I just didn't want to do that because I didn't want to put these in order, and I was making a lot more than 10, and like, it just wasn't what I wanted to do. But 10 in itself is a great thing to have up there, you know? It's a great way to get people to look. Just any kind of number, any kind of round solid number is always great. And I didn't want it to say 15 or 20, because I, I, I actually recommend like 20 videos. If it said 20, then it's overwhelming. It's like, oh, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna have time to watch 20 anime music videos, you know? But if it's 10, it's like, hmm, I could probably watch all that in an hour, you know? That's anime music videos three minutes long, you know? Of course I wanna know what 10 anime music videos I should watch right now, you know? The video's 15 minutes long, suggests that maybe this won't, won't take you all day. But of course, it's a lot more than 10 recommendations. But if it said 17 or 18, it's not the same. It's not the same as 10. But no one's going to complain that they got more than 10. No one's gonna say like, oh, you bastard, you tricked me. There were more than 10 in this video. If anything, they're all happy about it. I mean, a bunch of people have pointed it out. Most of them think it's funny, because it is funny. It's kind of a joke, and that's why at the end of the video, I call attention to it. I'm like, that was like 10 or so music videos, I guess. Uh, whatever, this video's long now, let's move on. You know, like, the joke sort of is, it was more than 10. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that I love doing the most, is if I can, if I can give you a title that you, you go, you know, and, and this happens to varying degrees. People were a little bit more um, wary of like uh, how to recognize a great anime in just one episode or how to recognize a terrible anime in just one episode because those titles weren't exactly what I was doing. They were, you know, close enough in my opinion and I didn't really have a better title for those videos but they were close enough to the same thing as what I was doing that, uh, you know, and it, some people did call out, like, this is not actually what the video is, and I was like, yeah, that's kind of fair, but what would you have titled this video, you know, like, it's, it is what it is, kind of, and the title is what would be the most attention-grabbing, and it worked wonders. Those titles and those thumbnails were unbelievably successful, especially the one for how to recognize a terrible anime in just one episode. Super provocative title, you know, people want to know, how to do that. People want to know why you think you can do that. You know, they're upset immediately. And I've got this super close up of this super cute girl from Gate just staring right into the camera, looking moe as fuck. Because you gotta remember that even though the anime sphere talks so much shit about cute girls, they overwhelmingly adore cute girls. There's a reason cute girls are so fucking successful and popular, you know? It's kind of like how even though k gets shit-talked all the time by people who are like, oh, this is the death of anime, everything's cute girls, that show was super successful. Tons of people have seen that, you know, both in Japan and the West. I mean, it wasn't as successful here in terms of, like, sales figures, because, I mean, Bandai did a terrible job of releasing most of the things they released in the late 2000s at way over overpriced uh, prices when everyone else was slashing their prices down to nothing and not really advertising shows like K-On, at least not in the US. Um, so it was kind of perplexing that they were like releasing it for these high budget, uh, you know, high budget release but not really advertising it that well. Um, more like, you know, letting people know what it is or what the appeal is. But yeah, like, I feel like, you know, people want so badly to portray this image that we're totally not about cute girls, but they are. They are totally about cute girls, by and large, you know. Maybe those people aren't the ones leaving the comments, because the people commenting about anime are the ones who are dissatisfied. The people who are satisfied have no reason to raise hell about how many cute girls there are, but the cute girls are the most popular. So if you post some cute girl, if you post a hot anime girl in your pic picture, you know, Misty Cronexia is like disgusting with how he games the system you know he he just straight up posts like the most pornographic thumbnails he can get away with and of course people click on it because like i mean every time i see one i'm like i come very close to clicking on it i'm like i want to know what this incredibly hot anime girl is from but i know i'm not going to get the answer 
because I know the formula. I know that Misty Credexia is just putting that thumbnail there so you'll click on the video and then you'll have to, you know, look at his fucking bald ass while he, like, <laughs> talks to you about a bunch of other bullshit that I don't care about and I'm never gonna find that thumbnail that I wanted, that I came for. So, that's why, you know, and I'm not willing to go that far because I have a brand. I have a brand that is somewhat classy, somewhat, uh, you know, approachable, somewhat like this guy appeal- I, I want to simultaneously appeal to hardcore otaku while also suggesting to the people who are embarrassed about hardcore otaku that they can totally watch the videos as well. You know, whereas like Misty Cronexia, I don't- I think a lot of people would be embarrassed to say that they liked him, you know, um, whereas the- the people who just don't care, uh, especially younger people who just don't give a fuck are gonna watch all the videos. So, you know, I wanna hit that middle ground, but again, for me, it's all about these middle grounds. It's all about maximum viewer engagement, but, like, in, in terms of, like, getting the most views possible while still making what I wanted to make. And it can never be lazy. Because, like, I don't want to make lazy videos. I don't want to make videos that are just about getting clicks. I want people to click on a video that I thought was great, and I'm going to make them think it's great. So with the anime music videos thing, like, for me, what was the... In what made that video fulfilling is that this video comes out for the song called Shelter. It gets super big. Everyone's talking about it. And I think... A, I can capitalize on the success of Shelter to talk about a part of the medium that I'm a big fan of that people don't talk about enough. You know, I love anime music videos. I get it. This is now a platform being afforded to me to share ones that I like. I also want to have seen them all and to be able to suggest all the good ones I can think of. Now, I will say, um, god damn, Siren's outside. There's a lot of people who are commenting with like, why not this show? Why not that one? Why didn't you include this? A lot of them are ones I just haven't seen, because in spite of the fact that I see, I said I've seen them all, there's some that are not really... Cause I, I watched everything that's considered a music video by my anime list. So anything that's not professionally released, you know, I didn't watch. Um, some of the Animator Expo shorts that I still haven't seen yet were music videos, which I fucking tried to look into that. I, like, looked up, you know, which ones are music videos. I didn't get, like, any results that were helpful. So that's why I didn't include more Animator Expo ones, because I wasn't sure which one are music videos, and I haven't seen all of the Animator Expo yet. But I can probably just do a video about the Animator Expo at a later date. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a few I didn't include because I hadn't seen them. Some because I, I just didn't care for them and stuff. But, like... You know, ultimately the point of the video was to just share a bunch of them. It wasn't about, like, here's a comprehensive list, nor was it about, here's a top list. A lot of people seem to think this was a top 10, which was not at all the case, but, you know, whatever. So, but the, the idea was, like, let's have seen all the music videos that I, that I can, and let's share all these cool ones and like get people to watch something that they wouldn't have watched otherwise that they would never have known existed and so you know the amount of research i put into this vastly outweighs what anyone else would put into a, a 10 list of any kind you know because that's my style i want to overwhelm with how much research i do i want to be that guy who went that far you know not only because it's cool it makes me look cool uh but also because i just that's the kind of content i want to see i wish everyone was doing this much research into a top tens list you know and if i can do that much research for something and pour that much heart and energy into it and yet still have it managed to be successful that will be the perfect thing you know so the title and the thumbnail are entirely in service of that and i i capitalized so hard on shelter for this like i just took you know i i showed clips from it at the start i mentioned it i never mentioned my opinion of it which is just kind of meh you know i just say hey Shelter's really popular. Here's a bunch of other anime music videos. You know, I'm not here to start a fight. I'm not here to make people talk about Shelter. I'm here to make people watch these videos using Shelter as the springboard. And of course, I used Shelter as the thumbnail. And I, I would have liked a different thumbnail. I didn't want it to be the exact same one that the fucking video itself uses. I did crop it. 
um, to be a better fit for my style, which is like hyper close up with with blue in the background. But that's the thing, the thumbnail was too perfect, like because it's super close up of a cute girl's face and it's got a bright blue sky. And for whatever reason, bright blue does really well for me. Uh, I don't know if this is true of everybody. I don't know if there's any science behind this. And I have some thumbnails that are on big videos that aren't all blue, but almost all of my biggest videos are all blue thumbnails. Uh, Sword Art Online sucks part one, blue thumbnail. Uh, why good anime is hard to make, blue thumbnail. Uh, how to recognize a terrible anime in just one episode, blue thumbnail. Um, one, why One Piece works so well, blue thumbnail. So, uh, and most, most of them are blue either because of hair or because of the sky. So, blue just seems to be a really attention-grabbing thumbnail for whatever kind of audience watches my videos. So I definitely gravitate to, and I like them too. I love, like, blue, how it pops off of the screen and stuff. So, you know, that's why I chose blue hie for that, uh, Shinbo thing. Why I chose blue blue sky behind the girl from shelter but like yeah everything about this video is meant to say hey you liked shelter here's more and like if i can perfectly capitalize on the success of shelter to get people to watch something that is totally my thing and something they did not at all anticipate getting then that's perfect you know just getting people to, to, to say, like, to, to suggest to the audience that they're going to get the kind of trashy bullshit they want. You know, they want the top ten. They want the cute girls. They want the reminder of the thing they already care about, like shelter. They want to just watch a video about something they already have opinions about and just want reaffirmation that someone else cares about the thing they care about. So, yeah, it looks like it's just a video about shelter, but it's not. It's the opposite. It's about a bunch of obscure shit that no one cares about except me and I'm now forcing you to care about it if I can you know so yeah that's sort of my that's that's a, that's the trick of the trade that's what my goal is be the most myself possible and get the most people to care about it possible um, as opposed to trying to you know go to my audience because I don't want to do that I don't want to go to them and when I whenever I try I regret it you know like when I not to say that I don't like these videos but I mean I've made it clear in the past that like every once in a while I cover a popular show just so that I can have you know something new or current or popular to talk about you know um Usually it's when I just don't have any other ideas. I'll be like, all right, let's make a video about Watamote. People like Watamote, and that video is huge. Let's make a video about Erased and Myriad Colors Phantom World. Those videos are huge. Kabaneri, that video is huge. You know, it's it's a very easy way to to reach success. And I, I only do it if I have something to say. Mob Psycho 100, huge, huge video. All those were the most popular anime of the season that they were airing. I found something to say about them, so I made a video about it, and, you know, but the, the main thrust of why this show, why cover this show, is because it's the biggest show of the season, and people will come to me for it, and, you know, if I was, I feel like if I was a normal YouTuber, if I was someone like a Gigguk or something, that would be all I do. I just find the most popular shows, and not Gigguk, I meant uh, Glass Reflection, though Gigguk is, is similar. They, you know, they go after what's the talking point, what are people talking about right now, and they respond to it, and they, you know, they just whip up the the audience reaction they want. Um, whereas for me, it's like the opposite point. Get people invested even though they didn't think they'd care. Use uh, ReZero as a platform to talk about something else, you know, which um, I almost wish that, you know, the that Planetarian and ReZero had been reversed, where we could have had Re like used the ReZero video to s tell people to watch Planetarian, because unfortunately, as expected, my ReZero, Pleep in the Weeb, uh, it has uh, three times the view counts of the Planetarian Pleep in the Weeb, you know, so, which is ex to be expected, but if we could have diverted people there, that would have been nice, but you know, the reason ReZero we even covered it on Plebe in the Weeb, was to get more attention to Plebe in the Weeb, a show that people would not have watched. It was, a, you know, a, a two guys talking show that is totally different from my normal content. Nobody really knows who Jesse is. The title is not 
uh, clickbaity. You know, the plebe and the weeb is the name of a show. It's not a clickbait title that will get like, you know, if I had been trying to make those just clickbaity, it would have just been like re zero best or worst show on television or something, you know, like because who cares? It, it, it doesn't matter what the title of the video is, but with the plebe and the weeb, we want it to be a series and we want it to be recognized as such. But covering ReZero at all is a huge boost to the series. You know, if we hadn't covered that show, then there's a good chance, or, or covered anything popular, you know, like we covered your name because it was new and it was making waves, and ReZero because it was a huge deal. You know, Planetarian is more of the kind of show that me and Jesse would be more inclined to watch and more inclined to talk about, but that video has way fewer views, and it would not have gotten Plebe and the Weave off the ground, and it would have just sank down my channel, you know? Though I am impressed by how many views it did get, at least. You know, I, I think 21k was a pretty healthy amount, even if that's like, for my current self, that's like the lowest I'm likely to get at all, you know? Um, like, it used to be that I had videos that that if it was like no one cared about it, it, it was below 10k, but now I'm big enough that like 20k is kind of like the the rock bottom I can hit, but nonetheless, I'm glad that that's the rock bottom I can hit, because that's a lot of people, and that's a lot of heads to wa go watch Planetarian, you know, and, uh, and go watch Jesse's content, but yeah, I mean, and I mean, even with the thumbnails for Plebe and the Weeb, like, I was going to make the thumbnail for, uh, like, Jesse made all the thumbnails for it, and I would have had your name would have been the image of her groping her own tits from the start of the movie, because we do talk about that scene. I would have had, uh, the ReZero one would have just been a close-up of Rem and Ram, like as close as I could get into their faces, but at least they were in there, uh, for Jesse's thumbnail. And then with Planetary and just, you know, close-up of cute girl's face, like that's close up a face it's it is a one-way ticket to your video getting views and it's so satisfying when you do it and it works like when you put the like with the anime is uh how to recognize a terrible anime in just one episode i knew what th the thumbnail was going to be immediately when i was watching gate because like the second that girl's face popped up on camera and it just hogged the whole frame and it was just this perfect shot of this girl's face i was like that's the thumbnail. You know, like, I figured that out before I was done writing the fucking script. And I was so fucking excited to use it. And that video has over a million views. It's my second most viewed... No, yeah, my second most viewed video of all time. Um, people... The title and the thumbnail. And, like, I told this to Mother's Basement, and he's totally changed the way he does titles and thumbnails as a result. But he's still not doing it right because he'll he'll put like a kind of okay thumbnail but then he puts his stupid animated avatar over it which or his cartoon guy which is totally antithetical to making a good thumbnail and unnecessary and i don't know why he does that i keep telling him to stop but he keeps doing it uh it's it's terrible it's it's like it's canceling out the effect of the thumbnail you know but he's gotten better with the clickbait titles he he stopped you know it used to be like uh what's in an op X show and then now it's called like how one how strong is one punch man's punch what's in an OP you know um, personally I would cut out the extra part entirely I would just make it what it is because there's no reason to have a series title it doesn't the only people who care that it's a part of the series are people who watch all your videos you know like if you can come up with a series title that's also clickbait like cool character designs is a good clickbaity title for the kind of videos those are like that's what the video is is about cool character designs but it also is eye catching oh i want to hear about cool character designs you know um so that's a good clickbait series but if it's a series title that doesn't really mean anything to the to the audience you know like in a in a major way like what's in an op is okay but it doesn't make me like rush to click in the way that just saying like here's what's cool about this show's op you know gets you in um but you know i know jeff likes to keep things as part of a series and he, he kind of has like an older youtuber mindset because it used to be that you know people really wanted things to be a part of the series so that people like knew that there was more and they knew to go find more of it but nowadays if people want more of your content they subscribe like youtube is a subscriber culture now it wasn't like that before you know back in the day there was 
<coughs> there was not this push for subscriptions. And when YouTube redesigned the whole website back in like 2013, they did it around subscriptions. They built it around how do we make people get drawn to the subscribe button. That's why the subscribe button's dead center in your channel on the page, you know? Like they want to drive people towards subscribing to channels because they realized that that was the best way for content creators to, you know, keep their audience and keep making revenue. So yeah, like you really want subscriptions and the people who are subscribed to your channel, it doesn't matter that it's a series. They get it, you know? Now you can codify your thumbnails and titles in a way. I think the best way to handle doing a series is color coded thumbnails. You know, guys like Chaseface do this well, where, uh, you know, if it's part of one series, then it all has the same color of thumbnail, but the title and thumbnail can be something clickbaity, you know? If you want to have, uh, or um, Glass Reflections does this well too, where he's got like, you know, if it's a proper review, then it's like a close up of a character's face and like a, a blue, like techno y background, and it's like, you know, this anime review. But then if he does like the impressions, then it's like a gray background, and it's close up of a face on a gray background, and this is an impressions video. And you can instantly tell looking at his channel, like, okay, there's several different series here, which one am I interested in? Canapa Effect does something similar. His, uh, he uses like blue text for all of his, um, you know, creator spotlight videos, and then other kinds of text for other stuff. That's a good method of doing it, because it doesn't take away from your ability to make things clickbaity. Um, while also notifying it as a series. So, you know. But anyways, everyone needs to pay more attention to their titles and thumbnails. They're the only things that matter. The only things that matter for views. The only things. Because you just have to get them to click the video. That's all that matters. Like, once they're there, they will find out that it's a genius video and they'll reshare it. You know, if you're making, if you're making good content, then, then it's going to, you know, it's going to get, um, going to get reshared once people find it, once they find out it's good, but they have to find out it's good first, you know? And they're not going to find out it's good if they're not going to find it, if they're not going to click on it in the first place. If it's got a weird title and a weird thumbnail and people don't understand what the appeal of it is, they're not going to click on it. Um, so you just got to get your fucking hooks in people and drag them kicking and screaming over to what you want to do. Alright, that's it for this segment. Just opened up a beer. So as an addendum to the stuff I was saying like four days ago, or for you like one minute ago, um, advice for YouTubers, tag yourself on all your videos. Your tags have to do with what shows up in the related videos on the side. and. For my whole YouTube career, the overwhelming majority of hits that I get that aren't from subscribers are from related videos. And if you tag yourself all the time, it means your own videos are more likely to show up in the related videos. So always tag your own name. Write your own name into the tags. On the PCP, all the tags are pretty much just the names of all the PCP members. I don't know how well that works, but... Um, it's a, you know, it's worth doing. So I gotta talk about one of the big things going on with me right now, which is that I am turning into a fucking monster. This is gonna contradict everything I was saying on the Fat Fuckery podcast. We were talking about lifting, and I was like, oh, lifting sucks, it just leaves you exhausted all day, blah blah blah, and all that shit. Well, you know, at the start of that podcast, we hadn't finished building the squat rack, the one that Ben brought with him. Um, we told a whole story about that, but we did like within a couple days of that podcast And so me and Ben started lifting and what I quickly realized is that lifting is fucking awesome Now yes, it does have the negative consequence of being Exhausting and your muscles feel sore all the time at least so far mine have you know They've never because we keep pushing ourselves to higher and higher weights every time we do it We've, we've never just been maintenance lifting. It's all strength lifting all in increasing the the amount we lift every other day so you know it's it's been a, a fairly brutal workout schedule but I feel strong and every time like right after working out it's just like you just feel the pump and it's just like yes I can do anything I am a god you know <laughs> and it definitely gives me more of like a strut and like more just I don't know I feel good about whatever I'm doing 
And it's funny because, you know, so much of my time is spent sitting around and just like, when I'm not sitting around, I'm probably eating. I say this all the time, how I pretty much just leave the house to go get food. Uh, and, you know, that can make me feel like I'm not doing enough physical activity, like I'm not getting out enough and stuff like that. But lifting, which only takes like half an hour the, the, with the lifting, you know, the schedule me and Ben have been doing, is like... It feels like it meets that need completely. It's like, you know, working yourself to such physical exhaustion that it's like, yes, I have done my physicality for for the day, you know? And now I can feel good about just sitting down for eight hours doing work, you know, or just getting up to go eat and stuff like that. I don't feel like I'm hugely missing out on the rest of the world or, or just on doing anything physical. And... It's, I mean, it's been fun. Me and Ben have been, you know, doing the workouts together. Uh, it's just a, a fun time to just pump out some iron, you know, see what we can, see how high we can raise our, uh, our, our fucking lifting amounts and stuff. Feel the gains flowing through us. But here's what's, here's why it's turned me into a monster. Because ever since we started, started lifting, I can't stop eating. I've been eating constantly in larger and larger portions. Like, I've always been kind of a small eater. There's only been a couple of times in my life where I've been able to eat like more than normal and it's usually like, like it's like the kind of thing where once you start eating big, you can continue to eat big. But if you typically don't, then it's like you, you feel capped out at a lower level, you know? I'm the type of guy who often doesn't get the side dish with my order. You know, go, go, to a, go to a fast food restaurant, I don't need the fries. I don't need the combo, you know. Uh, buy one, get one free, I might eat half of the second thing, you know. I've never been someone who eats, like, a huge portion or even, like, a normal portion. But, like, now, ever since I started lifting, it's just been like, I will eat everything in sight. It doesn't matter. Give me the biggest thing on the menu. I'll fucking put it down. Give me the two. I need the two. I also need the large drink, you know? <laughs> I usually can't even finish uh, a fucking medium-sized drink uh, of, like, soda, you know, with my meal. Now I'm just chugging down these fucking big-ass drinks. I went to Hardee's yesterday. I had, like, they had a steak, egg, and cheese biscuit buy one get one free i got two the guy said do you want a dollar drink and i'm like what the fuck is a dollar drink and he said it's cheaper than the small or yeah because i think i asked for small but then he gives me the dollar drink and it's a fucking huge cup it's like an extra large drink and i'm like i don't know why that's a dollar but sure i'll take it drank the whole fucking thing you know along with eating both steak egg and cheese biscuits which i i'm, I'm certain i wouldn't have been able to do two weeks ago it's just given me such a fucking appetite and I know that the way I'm eating, because, you know, you're supposed to eat big to get big. If you're lifting big, you gotta eat big. But you gotta eat right, you know? The key is to maximize on protein, but not to eat a bunch of fat and a bunch of sugar. Because if you do, you're gonna get, you know, you'll, your muscles will get bigger, but you're also gonna get fat. But I, I don't care. Like, it feels so gratifying to, like, pump you know, to just lift heavy weight and then be just, and then just go eat everything that I want. It doesn't matter what, I just, I want it. It's going in my mouth. There's no hesitation. There's no looking at the labels. There's no nothing. I have been eating like a fucking pig and I know I'm going to get fat, but I'm going to get strong fat. And I feel like, I feel like I like that. I want to, I want to be a mosh pit guy. That's what that's the body I think I'm going for is the guy in the mosh pit at metal shows which I've, I've been to a considerable number of metal shows I've been in a few mosh pits I'm usually the guy who gets pushed around pretty hard I usually walk out pretty bruised you know because there's usually at least one guy in there who's some big fat buff motherfucker with huge muscles huge chest huge arms but you know like a beer beer gut I see myself being that guy because honestly for me like, I feel like vices are, like, I don't, I don't get the point of life without them to some extent. I guess if you, if you get really into something like running and it makes you feel like your life has been affirmed or something like that, like, you don't need any vices because you have running, which seems to be the way that, that runners act, you know, like a, like a Casey Neistat or even my dad, like, my dad used to smoke and drink all the time, you know, he was like a pack-a-day smoker. He, he drank a lot at parties and shit, 
completely quit both of those, took up running, that's what he does now. And maybe that'll be me one day. Maybe in my 30s or so, I'll eventually, you know, my dad started late. He didn't really start running till his like late, late 30s, early 40s, I think. But, uh, you know, maybe that'll be me one day. But right now, it's hard for me to go very long without a vice because I start to wonder why am I even alive for this? You know, like why, why be a person who has to eat healthy and watch what you eat and not drink too much and not smoke? Because those are the things that make life fun. Those are the things that make it easy to do to do work all the time. You know, like to, to not, I live a lifestyle where all I really want to do is work. That's all I want to do. All I want to do is watch anime and make videos about anime and make vlogs and make podcasts and, and you know, collaborate with other creative people. That's like the only desire I really have. Uh, other than, like, you know, having interesting conversations. I like doing that, you know. I take breaks from work to go hang out and talk to people both in real life and online. You know, offline and online. I don't know why I still say in real life. I hate that being equated with something different but it's just such an ingrained phrase but anyway yeah you know having co interesting conversations is great making stuff is great and there's nothing else i really like to do i don't really like to leave the house except to eat you know that's the only reason i want to leave i've i've, I've done the whole go out and do things stuff things aren't interesting the beach is not that fun Mount Trashmore is not that fun. Maybe once a month, it's fun to go out and, and do something somewhere, you know? Gatherings all week. I don't care. I just want to stay home and work. And all I want to do other than that is stuff that will make me feel like I have not sat in one spot for eight hours. And there's a few easy ways to not feel that way. One is to get up and go have a smoke. It's such an easy way to like, I've been working for an hour, I kind of want to just stand up and have a break. You go outside, you smoke a cigarette, you come back in, you feel ready to take on the next hour of work. Or, um, I'm about to do a huge editing job that I don't want to do, let's have some beers. It'll make this easier, you know? Like, the other day, what was this, two days ago, I, um, I had... Okay, so everything I talked about in the previous podcast is not happening the way I described it, which is good, and because that leaves me the opportunity now to not describe this stuff that I am doing in too much detail so that it can still happen. Um, but I'll go into at least this much, because this is already guaranteed, because I described that I had written six videos for, uh, for a month-long project in November to make a ton of videos all at once. I ended up canceling that project because it was... Uh, financially retarded to make 15 videos in one month. I obviously can't Patreon all of them, and I already had got those six ideas that I had that were so good that I like wrote instantly. Those were all the like ideas I had that I really wanted to do, and all the other ones I'm looking at like, eh, this, eh, you know, I don't want to write this video. But I have another project that I am excited about, and I'm just going to get straight to work on that as opposed to the whole novel of videos in November. So I'm already working on the next big project but instead I now have you know six videos that Davu can make at his own pace over the course of one will come out by the end of this month and the other five will come out over the course of November and so like I'm looking at it like that's uh five videos that are already written all I have to do is voice them and then the rest of it's Davu you know like I mean there's a few that I have to make some more notes for but basically I can have all my work for November done as soon as these are all voiced. So two days ago, I just sat in my closet and voiced all five scripts one after another for like probably two and a half hours or something and just sat in the closet, voiced every single one of them. Then I came out of the closet <laughs> and uh, I edited all of them. And so, you know, editing audio is not horribly difficult or time consuming it's just kind of a grind because it's just remove all the spaces and bad takes and then add in new spaces anywhere that there's not enough space between words which basically means listen to the same 15 minute script like three times in the process of editing it to sound to sound coherent um it's kind of boring especially to do on five videos at once so had a few beers made it easier you know by the time i was done i was feeling pretty drunk 
and was ready to pass out. Great day of productivity. That's now five videos that I have done my whole part for. And so the entire month of November, if I really wanted to, I could fucking sleep, you know. But of course, because all I like to do is work, I'm already started on the next big project that'll probably start coming out in December. And I've, you know, I'm planning all these other things that I want to do. We've got planning for the plebe and the weeb to worry about. We're trying to figure out the situation with getting Jesse and Nate down here. I've been guesting on podcasts, putting together my own podcast like this one, my own vlogs. I have a bunch of, I have like five vlog series, five vlog videos that are like halfway done or even less. Like, okay. I started up all these new vlog series that are related to like watching a show. There's like uh, the second chances board, and what happened with that was I, 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 you know, I selected the next show. I watched the first episode while I was drunk, and I it was it was kind of too difficult to comprehend. Like there's too much going on for my drunk mind to process, so I decided to wait till I was sober to watch any more of it. And I just haven't gotten around to it because I'm not that ex like I didn't want to drop the show based on that first episode, but I'm also not excited to watch more of it, and I probably will drop it before the end. But like, I don't know. Um, and then there was the the exact same story with random ass recommendations. I shot the dart at the screen, got the next show, watched the first episode of it. And, like, I didn't dislike it, but I also wasn't so enthusiastic about continuing that I would watch the rest immediately. Then I started up uh, another thing that I won't describe too much, which is another select a show thing. I selected a show, watched the first four episodes, really loved them, but got busy with other stuff and haven't gotten around to watching the rest of the show. Which is horribly ironic, considering the nature of this particular show, um, which you'll see eventually. And then... Uh, and then there's also finish or fail for 2016 shows, which of course the entire fucking summer season ended. So now there's like 30 fucking shows that I had on hold that I now have to try to watch. So all of that is waiting. And in the meantime, I'm working on this other huge series that I just, you know, got excited about and launched right into. So, uh, there's just too many have finished and unfinished projects going on. Uh, I have to edit this um, commentary for the for the uh, for the Patreon before like tomorrow. And meanwhile, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to start promoting the PCP guys because like I'm trying to get all everyone on the PCP more popular and more famous because all of us are trying to do this as careers and I'm the only one other than Jeff who's like really succeeding at it right now Jesse is too but like Jesse has a lot of stuff that's siphoning his money away other than just the fact that he spends it haphazardly um but like we want to get Jesse and Nate living down here and Hippo eventually and we want everybody to be like satisfyingly able to make careers off their art and so I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to help promote these guys how I'm going to like uh you know help them to find content that they can produce that'll that'll make it easier to have a career doing this stuff you know that's that's kind of the the thing we're all chasing is to have everybody as a group be able to you know sustain ourselves off of this shit and right now my my patreon i'm actually kind of i wouldn't say i'm like losing money or anything but my patreon is like kind of just floating around a number that it's just kind of stable at and i'm not gaining a ton of views on my new videos because i've chosen to work on stuff that's not topical and not like big stat cow stuff which i mean is deliberate i i just want to do what i want to do but you know there's a reason I do those stat cow videos sometimes. It's because I want the growth that comes with it. And that's not coming right now because I'm doing weird shit like Akiyuki Shinbo in the 90s and stuff like that. That uh, And Plebe and the Weeb. That's not going to draw the numbers the way that a, you know, clickbaity title on a current show is going to do. So point being... I've got all this stuff going on. Vices are a great way to help me through it. All I want to do is do all these vlogging projects, all these podcasts, all these fucking videos from my main channel. All these huge research projects that I keep getting myself into. And the project, it really is reaching the point 
I'm reaching the promised point. I used to always say that like if I hit this amount on Patreon, I'll be able to do bigger and bigger projects. I kept saying that like, guys, if you get me up to a thousand dollars a video and I only need to make two videos a month and those videos can be as big as I want them to be. They can be these huge weeks long research projects that are just like, you know, deep and involving. And that's exactly what I'm now doing. Stuff like Shinbo in the 90s you know, is a project where it just takes that long to watch all those shows and do all that research for it. Um, and it's, I'm so glad, like, this is what I've always wanted to be doing is these huge projects. Uh, and now that's exactly where things are going. But, um, but in the meantime, it's like, I just want to have a couple of beers, a couple of cigarettes, and eat whatever I want because eating makes me happy. Eating things I like makes me happy. Eating things I don't like doesn't make me happy. You know, like eating healthier food, you do get that sense of like, wow, I feel physically better, but there's no satisfaction in it. There's no sense of reward. There's no sense of like, I just worked for three hours and I want something to take the edge off. You know, when you just eat something that's just good for you, it just feels like, well, I am now sustaining myself. Like, yes, I can now continue to live. I guess I'm not hungry anymore, but there's no sense of like, yeah, all right. I did something now back to work. At least not for me. I know it's different for some people. The Devu has been on a big health food kick and it's really working out for him. Uh, but for me, I take so much satisfaction from eating. It's such a huge, thing of you know this huge element of what I like and from drinking and from smoking um which I'm gonna try to cut out the smoking because that's gotten out of hand um vaping only made it worse and and uh I've been I've, I've been smoking too many cigarettes but only because I was like experimenting with different types because I, I bought a pack of blacks which is a clove cigarette that I've always wanted to try um, I mean, I've, I've tried one before, but I've always wanted to try and buy one, and, and I, like, hunted them down and bought a pack, and that was pretty cool, but those things take too long to smoke, and, um, you know, by the end of it, I've got a headache, so went through that pack, then, um, this is kind of its own story, but I was watching The Dick Show, uh, which if you're, if you're a patron of The Dick Show, you get to see, um, like, video feeds of the episodes, and Asterios Kokonos, who is a fantastic comedian who I love was finally on the show after like a long period of trying to get him on there and it was a fucking great show and Asterios is just smoking cigarettes constantly through the whole show and it was really funny and I am extremely suggestible so when I saw him smoking I immediately wanted some and what he was smoking was a cigarette brand called Dunhills which had this really interesting package and I was like okay I want to try those so I hunted them down and now I'm smoking a pack of Dunhills but once that's over I will hopefully stop um for at least a little while because I've, I've been burning through this pack at a rate that is completely beyond anything I've ever been doing before so it's not it's not a good look uh, in terms of getting addicted but you know cigarettes notwithstanding I do love drinking um, which I, I am good at doing in moderation I've never gotten like to the point of alcoholism or any kind of addiction with that it's purely a casual thing cigarettes it's starting to feel uh, very not casual which is why I'm worried about it but um but yeah like that stuff just gets me through man it's like that's what makes it so five days of non-stop work doesn't feel exhausting I don't feel like oh my god I haven't done anything I feel like wow I've accomplished so much and I've felt good the whole time and all of it's possible because of the lifting because the lifting is so satisfying and so like physically engaging and it makes me feel so like good afterwards like my body feels good and I, I look at myself in the mirror and I feel good because I see this like I see the confidence running through me I see my body slowly becoming more you know like like able to stand upright and and you know and have a, a posture to it that it's like 
yeah, I don't even care if I'm fat because who do I need to be skinny for? I don't know. I don't care. I'm not even like, it's, it's not like if I like lost a bunch of weight and got like really good looking that I would suddenly go out on the town and start like hooking up with girls or something like that's not going to happen. You know, even if I completely lost weight and I looked fantastic and beautiful, uh, it's still going to be me sitting around on the computer editing or, you know, writing videos for days on end. So it's like, um, as long as I feel good, it doesn't matter what I look like. I just want to feel good physically. And what makes me feel good physically is pumping fucking iron and feeling strong, you know? And as long as I feel strong, no amount of eating makes me feel completely gross. No amount of drinking makes me feel completely gross. And so I'm just totally indulging. I am completely breaking bad and going off the deep end and it feels great. And I, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I recommend that to anybody else, if that would work with anyone else's lifestyle. But, um, yeah, I just physically feel incredible. For the last, like, two and a half weeks, I felt great. And I, I mentioned at the start of the last Digi, uh, Digi Bros decom decompression chamber, I was like, you know, even though I need to decompress just because there's too much going on, I feel good. Like, I don't feel bad at all. Everything in my life feels really great right now. And that's entirely because of the lifting, the strictly regimented lifting, just every other day, me and Ben lift, you know? And then I feel, I feel incrementally stronger, I feel confident, and I can just eat whatever I want and not give a single fuck about anything. And I have been pigging out on a scale that I have never done before. And, uh, and probably spending too much money, but I mean, I don't really spend money on anything else. So my budget is so hard to exhaust because it like, it like the amount I spend on food looks like too much, but then there's nothing else taking it away. So I always look at my bank and there's still money there. And I'm like, well, as long as there's still money there, I, I guess it doesn't matter, but we'll see. We'll see what happens when tax day comes and it all comes crashing down around me and I have to fucking make an LLC and I gotta fucking register DeVu probably as an employee because I'm sure he's made 10 grand this year. Uh, uh, I don't want to do any of that. I need to, I looked up the rates for hiring an accountant. They were too high. Uh, I gotta figure out how to do it all myself. <sighs> Mo money, mo problems. Alright, this is either the end of this episode or there's going to be another segment that I record tomorrow before I post this. So, look forward to that and uh, see you then. You know, all week long I had fully intended on finishing and editing and uploading this thing on the 30th. And the 30th came around, sat around all day, kept thinking I was going to do it, but putting it putting it off for this reason or another and now it's already the next day but I wanted to talk a little bit about why this is on the PCP channel because some people were saying that this seems like a very after dark kind of a uh, kind of show and I get where they're coming from the explanation is something that I think anyone will understand who's an artist and probably a lot of other people will too which is just basically about the different ways that you comp com ugh, compartmentalize your thoughts and your works and just what you do and there's sort of the reason that I have so many channels and I think this applies to everyone I know who has multiple channels is that each one has a very distinctive voice and purpose you know some people back back in the day we started up multiple channels because we thought well you know this channels for anime this one will be for this this one will be for that but uh, over time it's come to be more of like the character of the content that's on it so my main channel is meant specifically for like you know highly edited videos that have a, a concrete point but it's not just that it's also that they're they're kind of individual like each one while, while I do expect that people you know watch more than one video on the channel if they want to fully get like where I'm coming from with my videos because I think there's a sort of ongoing narrative of the way I talk about shows. Um, I don't expect that people who watch the channel will know me that well. I don't expect them to know like everything I've ever done. I don't expect them to know who I know, who I talk to, you know. 
Uh, so, if I make a video on the main channel where I'm just openly making reference to, like, the PCP, or to any of my friends, or to, like, more personal aspects that I don't expect most of those people to have heard of, or, like, to get where I'm coming from, then I think it, it would it would be weird, you know? So it's like each each video on there is more about here's a subject I'm dissecting, and you can go from this video to any of the others, and it'll it'll continually make sense. It's that kind of body of work. Whereas on other channels like After Dark, I have more of an expectation that if you're watching After Dark, it's because you're invested in me. Not so much that you're invested in anime or in analysis per se, you're just invested in what's Digibro up to. And that channel is intentionally random. It's just whatever comes to mind is up there. It could be a vlog, it could be a music video, it could be anything. You know, I don't market it in such a way that, uh, that I expect people to, you know, subscribe for one kind of content. Now I know that, it, I mean, that's not, in terms of uh, marketability, it's probably a terrible idea. I mean, there's lots of stuff on After Dark that if the channel was just that, it would probably get bigger. And if I, you know, if I uh, changed the thumbnails and stuff to, to be more accessible, but I don't want it to be that. It's meant to be just anything goes, uh, take it or leave it, you know, it's the Digibro experience. Now, the PCP channel, though, is a little bit different because PCP channel is about regularity. It's about shows that come out on something resembling a schedule. You know, each show is a once a week schedule, with the exception of some of the specials that we do, like, you know, the Drawcast or Rowdy Fuckers Cop Killers. But even those are a series. There's a definitive style to it. There's not a lot of videos on this channel that are just totally out of nowhere. There's the 360 Classroom, which we do intend to do more of, so that's a series as well. Um, and the Great Dark Souls race is probably like the most just like, this is just a thing we did with all of us in it, um, kind of thing. But like, the, the idea of the channel is weekly shows that are usually pretty long. They're always like at least an hour. They're mostly podcasts. There's not a lot of visual element to this channel. Um, and when there is, it, in, in another part of it is that it's, it's all of us. And even if we're not all in the video, or even if it's like a one-person podcast, you know, there's still a lot of reference being made to the PCP, to other people involved. And so, you know, I think for that reason, this show kind of belongs here. Where if I, if I constantly talk about my online friends on Digibro After Dark, I don't know that all of my audience knows or cares about them. You know, like, if you're watching the PCP channel, it means that you know who all of us are probably, as opposed to on After Dark, which has its own distinct audience that's about me. So, yeah, I agree that this is the kind of content you would kind of expect from Digibro After Dark, but it's very formulated, and I wanted it to be that way. It's a weekly show-ish. It's, uh, you know, it's got this certain visual presentation, this certain style of audio. It's got music, which is unusual for my content, you know, so, yeah. That's why I think it's more of a Procrastinators Channel show. And we wanted, uh, Jesse especially wants each of us to have our own show, or for each combination of us to have our own show. So, like, we'd love it for the PCP channel to be, like, a bunch of different podcasts, uh, each of which have their own formula, their own regular intervals of output. And, uh, yeah, I think that's cool. And it's kind of... In a way, it's a lot like the Red Letter Media way of doing things, you know, where their channel is like, there's the best of the worst, there's half in the bag, there's review, and they're all sort of different, different takes on the same concept of two guys sit down and talk about a movie. Um, in a way, the Plebe and the Weeb would have been a good fit for this channel too, but that show is... Um, just we wanted it to be big, like I wanted to see how big of a deal the Plebe and the Weeb could get to be, so that's why we put it on my main channel, because I have the most subs out of everybody's channel, so, you know, I didn't want it to sort of languish in obscurity on something like the PCP channel, which is growing, but not huge, you know, at this point. But yeah, um, that's why it's here, and I think it's, I think it's good for it to be here, I like it being here. And I like the idea of the podcast in general. By the way, I thought I'd mention 
if you guys haven't been listening to Jesse's panel cast, you should be, because it's great. Um, so far, it's two for two on getting me to read a comic that uh, that I would have never heard of or ever read, and both of them I loved. I, I liked Gwenpool last week, and this week I read all of The Vision, which is actually a complete run. It's 12 issues, and it's finished, and it was it was great. Um, once again, I went out to try and buy it, but they didn't have it at Barnes & Noble, so... Um, one day I'll read a comic that is available. But yeah, uh, it's a good time, you should read that comic, and you should listen to the panel cast. And I guess that's about it. I don't- I don't want to talk too much on this podcast about the specifics of, like, what I've been up to. Because... Usually, those are things that will be represented in a video. It was one thing to talk about, like, the spreadsheets and stuff before, because that's an element of my work that doesn't actually appear on camera. But, like, I've been watching uh, Tsukuyomi Moon Phase for the last few days, and it's like, everything I have to say about it is going to be in the, the video about it, you know, and about Shinbo. Though I guess what I could talk about is the fact that because the show is pretty boring and I kind of lost interest in it about eight episodes in, I've just had it on on my second monitor and I've been like really struggling to pay enough attention to it, you know, to to get what I need because I'm just watching it for research. I, I don't care about the story at all. And it has elements that I really, really like. The character designs are incredible. Um, there's just great facial expressions. A lot of the characters are likable, and the show is good when it's just like a lighthearted, fun comedy, but it's rarely that. It's usually this really boring, plot-driven show where the story is fucking generic and garbage. Uh, so that's what I've been struggling through. Just smoked the last cigarette that I had in my pack, and I'm gonna quit now. Um, because that's getting to be a dangerous hobby, so getting out of that it's Halloween today got a video coming out kinda regret that I didn't um, I, I meant to post a like a patreon post of three months worth of vlogs and unpatroned videos I still might I always feel bad when I load multiple patron posts into the very end of the month because I feel like you know it suddenly hits people with multiple things to pay for right at the very end um, which feels like a transparent money grab, but it just so happens that because, you know, we get paid by the month, we always have a plan to, like, this video has to be out on this week, this one on this week, and this one by the end of the month. And so, like, you know, I both want to post this, like, hey, here's three months of, uh, three months of content that hadn't been patroned yet, and then also this new video. And part of the reason that I don't want to do it, um... Like, I don't want to do my post first because I pay Davu 40% of whatever I make on Patreon uh, for the videos that he edits. So anytime I make a Patreon post for something that wasn't edited by the Davu, and, you know, with each post you make exponentially less money. Like, the first of the month is where I make what it actually says on Patreon, and then each one after that is way, way less because most people have a monthly cap on how much they'll pay. So... You know, each video is basically worth more the earlier into the month it's posted. And so, if I post up, like, um, you know, my, just like, here's three months worth of vlogs that never got patroned, then that will make more than the video that DeVue's editing. And that means that DeVue gets paid a, a smaller amount than he would, uh, you know, if, if his video came out before my post. So, you know... I know Davu needs the money right now, so I'm kind of hoping his video comes out first. I mean, I could just pay him 40% of the other one instead, but yeah, because of all that, I was hesitating on posting it, but now it's the last day of the month, so if I post both on the very last day, then it, I don't know, it feels weird to me. I don't know if it feels weird to the audience. No one's ever complained about me doing it that way. No one ever complains that like at the very end of every month is when a ton more content comes out than normal. You know, like, when we had Kuroko no Basuke and Mob Psycho in, like, the same day. And then also at the end of the month is when the commentaries come out. So there's, like, a four-hour commentary. And then, like, you know, all this other stuff. I don't know if people treat that more as, like, a, Wow, I'm getting so much content all at once. Or if it's, like, a, Wow, 
you've uh, completely, you know, charged me all this shit I wasn't expecting right at the end of the month. But, I mean, everyone has their monthly limit set in place. So, you know, as long as, as long as you have that monthly limit, then you know, you know what you're in for with how much can be spent by you by the end of the month. I don't know. Patreon's weird. I'm thinking about doing some kind of really long vlog or maybe even podcast about the weird nature of... Uh, of living in a world where people fund you and 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 the nature of the cult of personality that's forming and how I get I get scared for people sometimes when they when they have to start up a patreon or something especially if they're starting it uh, on the back of something controversial because you kind of become like someone who's not just doing your job but who's trying to convince people that you are worth spending money on, you know, and a lot more of, like, stuff that's not connected directly to your work becomes a part of it. Where, like, you know, if I said something that deeply offended a, a contingent of my audience, or I got involved in some kind of drama, then that could affect my, you know, like, my Patreon. Whereas, I mean, that would happen with other stuff, and, and that's partly also what I'd want to get into into this podcast. In fact, I should just stop talking about this now, because I'm going to have a whole thing about it. It's a, it's an interesting sort of conundrum, um, and I've been in a unique position to observe it as an early adopter of Patreon, who's been using it for, God, three years? Holy shit, that's a lot. Um, well, yeah, that's about it for this episode. I just wanted to do one last segment before, uh, before wrapping it up. Um, so I'll see you next week, and have a good time. Have a nice night, and listen to this soothing music.